For almost two years, uh, I've been on a personal search to understand what being a Christian means for us in the present. Uh, and I'll explain. Uh, you see, my understanding of the faith uh, is often focused on basically two points in time. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus lived a righteous life. He was hung on a cross to die. He was buried, and three days later, he physically resurrected from the dead and walked out of the tomb. This is the gospel message. It's powerful. It's life-changing. It demonstrates God's love for us that, that he was the perfect lamb of God a suitable sacrifice for all sin in the world. And because of his life, because of his death, and because of his resurrection, you and I, we can be justified and adopted into God's family. The question is, <clears throat> now what? Anybody ever ask that question in the faith? <clears throat> what am I doing here, God? You ever thought about that? Have you ever felt God be distant in your life? Have you ever had moments where you felt like God was close, but then moments where you felt like God was far from you? And sometimes you wonder in those moments, what is it that I'm here to do? What, is, what does the faith mean for me today? A lot of teaching focuses on changing behavior. A lot of biblical teaching talks about changing behavior, living to please God. And, and that, that's no doubt part of what we attempt to do. But the key here is the motivation. The key is why we attempt to please God. You see, because saying those things, it just it carries the implication that if, that if I don't please God, then I have failed as a Christian. And the promised future of eternal life is in jeopardy because of my actions. And that's a lot of pressure, isn't it? It's a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure that I think people put on themselves. The weight of that is, is very heavy. It's very burdensome. And it stands in stark contrast to what Jesus said when he said, Take my yoke upon you. My, my burden is light. Sometimes Christianity feels very, like it's pressing down on our shoulders. It feels like a backpack that we're carrying around that has rocks just stuffed into it. And we don't understand what is going on. You see, this idea that salvation depends on us, this idea that what we do is going to cancel us out of heaven's uh, registrar. It's not true. You are not what you've done. That doesn't mean you're off the hook. I'm, I, let me make that very clear. It doesn't mean that you get to just live however you want, and that's, that's good to go. But your entry into heaven doesn't matter. It, it isn't based upon what you've done. Most importantly, this idea is not the gospel. It is, it is not the gospel. It is not good news. It, it, is, it is not what Jesus came to do. He said, after John 3.16, one of the most famous scriptures in all of, all of the Bible, he said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I didn't come to condemn them. I came to save the world. I came to be a hospital for the sick. Not the executioner, not the grim reaper, not any of those things. And so, this implies that salvation happens based on our action. And it says that today is about our performance, not about God's power. It, it implies that today we are left on our own, tested time after time, oftentimes feeling as if we're hung out to dry, trying to figure out life on our own. Haven't you ever wondered why you follow this faith? I mean, I mean, that almost seems blasphemous. But 
the idea here is, haven't you ever had that day where you're like, I don't get why I follow Jesus because I don't feel any help on his end. And it's okay to admit that. It's okay to say, Ugh, this is tough. Because a life of faith is tough, is it not? I should have got a hearty amen from that one because it's, it's some days it stinks. I'm not going to... We don't need to dumb it down. We don't need to pretend. We don't need to put it on a facade because if we're ever going to get anywhere, if we're ever going to grow, we need to know where we are. We need to wrestle with the truth that, 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 that lies within our hearts. And so, so we need to understand this. And so, so I ask you again, haven't you ever wondered why you ascribe to this faith? The storms are fierce and the struggles you face each and every day seem to be draining you of all hope. Haven't you ever read Scripture and thought, God, if you only showed up like you did back then? Haven't you ever asked the question, where are you today? I have. The day I ask God, where are you, God? The Spirit inside of me softly responded, I'm right here. And I know that sounds nuts. Believe me, I thought I was nuts too. So thinking I was crazy, I asked again, and, and again, I heard I'm right here. Third time's a charm, right? Just to make sure. <laughs> I asked a third, God, third time. I said, God, where are you? And again, his spirit spoke to me, and he said, I'm right here. in the midst of the most incredible pain of my life so far, brought about my most comforting and cherished moment of my life. And this moment is the one that kicked off my quest. God himself, in the person of the Holy Spirit, had just interacted with my mind to counsel to dispel fear, to give strength, to express his love and his presence, and to guard my heart and my mind as I navigated my difficult circumstances. God was with me in that moment. He showed up today. And more than that, he's been with me every moment from the day that I put my faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so listen to me that can be true for you as well. God can be present for you today. So my hope and my prayer and my purpose over the next few weeks, we're gonna spend about six weeks talking about God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, known by many different names in the scriptures. Counselor is one of them, and we're gonna see that today. But my purpose over the next few weeks is to kick off your own quest to understand how God is with you in the present day, active, alive, this, this, this day. Defeating fear, infusing godly power, and in, in putting on your hearts unconditional love and a holy judgment into your very heart and your mind. This is not, disclaimer, this is not about religious practices. There are certain things that we can do that sound like religious practices that will help enable us to hear and experience the Spirit. And I know that some of you are like, I know about the Spirit, but it sounds like a ghost story to me, right? Like it's one of those things you're like, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. And I'm in that camp sometimes, and that's okay. But I'm hoping that I will today, we'll give you some, some pointers to start with. We're going to unpack this a lot more in the coming weeks. But I'm hoping that I, I am able to introduce you to, if you've never been introduced to it, a relationship with the triune God. Not just God the Father, not just God the Son, but God the Spirit as well. It's about a relationship. It's not about religious practices. This is about a relationship. And so you, you've all had like relationship counsel before, right? Somebody's given you relationship advice. No? Yeah, okay. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, right? 
you know, you got you to gotta adjust the source where it's coming from. Um, but just like in relationships where you can learn principles, right? What's a, what's a, just to engage you a little bit, what is a relationship principle you've been given? Happy wife, happy life, happy life, yeah. Somehow it's all about pleasing the woman and not God. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> no. <laughs> no, it's good. There's been relationship advice, right? Those things are good. Those are also boundary breakers, uh, the ones that have come up. Um, but what you can think about here is how that works out in your relationship, if it's marriage, if it's if it's friendship, if it's a, a working relationship, how that works out in your personal relationship is gonna be different from the people sitting in this room, right? Different personalities, different temperaments, different passions, different desires, different things that they place value on. And so much in the same way, a relationship with the Lord, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, one that you are, you are feeling and communicating with, I'm gonna be able to give you some principles but it's up to you to put the work in. Whose responsibility is it to put the work in? Yours. Mine. All right? So I can breathe a bunch of hot air over the next few weeks. I'm going to just be honest with you. I can, I can talk about this. And you can be like, oh, that was really cool. But my hope is not to just teach you something so that you feel full after, like after a Sunday afternoon meal. My hope is that you would walk out of here actually hungry with a holy discontent, that you would begin to search the scriptures on your own, that you would begin to ask questions and, and, and begin to put into practice some of these things to begin to follow a path to understand how your relationship with the Lord works and operates today so that you can experience the power of God in your life today, not just 2,000 years ago, not just at some point in eternity when you are resurrected from the dead with Jesus Christ, but today, alive in your circumstances, in your frustrations, in your hopelessness. So I'm praying. I'm interceding on your behalf that beginning today, you will take this teaching beyond this gathering. That ultimately you will take this seriously and put in the work to grow in your relationship with the Lord because it will unleash the power of God in your life. It will. Now, a little commercial, a little break here, because before we look at our text today and before we get into the meat of this, this message, I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, I've learned a lot about this particular topic from other men, uh, other teachers, other pastors. Um, <clears throat> and these, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this sermon series is based off of a teaching uh, by a man, a man and pa uh, pastor named J.D. Greer. He wrote a book called Jesus Continued, and it's a, it's a fantastic book. Uh, it's been very useful for me, and I think it'll be very useful for you. So I've used some of the chapters in his book as a framework to put together these messages in order to teach you about this topic. So some of these thoughts aren't my original thoughts. Some of the things I say are coming straight from the book, and I'm not gonna um, you know, take the time to say, J.D. said that, J.D. said that. But a lot of this stuff, if you read that book, you're gonna recognize a lot of the flavors um, that are coming out from this. So I just wanted to be honest with you and let you know that it's not original. So will you take a look at this scripture <clears throat> with me? It comes out of John uh, chapter 15, verse 26. Um, it says this, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. So I said it earlier, who's the counselor? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, the, the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus says, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of what? Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Anybody have any idea who might be talking in this, this verse? Jesus is talking. So, a couple of principles that we need to look at just to kick things off. 
Counselor is another name for Holy Spirit. He comes from God the Father, all right? Uh, there's, this, there's this doctrine that we hold when we look at the, the scriptures. You won't find this word in the Bible, but, but we, we, see, we have one God who expresses himself in three persons, right? We have God the Father, we have God the Son, who is Jesus, and we have God the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit who we are talking about today. Um, and, and so we're gonna, we're gonna look at this Jesus calls him the spirit of truth who will testify about Jesus. So we have kind of a function, a purpose happening here, coming directly from the lips of Jesus. J.I. Packer, another pastor, says that the Holy Spirit has a what's called a floodlight ministry. What's a floodlight do? Illuminates. It just boom, right? It's not just a flashlight. It's not like a little LED light. What's a floodlight do? It's got a ton of light, right? It's going to light up. I used to have one for for the backyard that would just light up at night so we could play like like, um, uh, badminton at night and and do different things outside and play games and different things like that. So it will light up an entire area. So what J.I. Packer says, he has a floodlight ministry. And so his ultimate purpose is to illuminate Jesus, right? His, his purpose, he will testify about me. The Holy Spirit's purpose is to illuminate Jesus. Say that, illuminate Jesus. Illuminate. All right, we got to get that straight because if we don't understand his purpose, we're going to get a lot of other things wrong. We're going to get a lot of other things all messed up. Straight from Jesus' lips, he's here to illuminate Jesus, to shine a bright light on the gospel and help our hearts, not just our heads, Understand this. So understand then that this means that the Holy Spirit's presence is intricately linked to the gospel. It is basically inseparable from the gospel. What is the gospel? Just so we're clear. It's the good news. About what? Jesus. The fact that Jesus came to this world. He lived a perfect life. He lived righteously. He was put to death on a cross. He died, was buried in a tomb for three days. And that day, on that third day, that stone was rolled away by an angelic heavenly host. And he walked out physically from that tomb, from that grave, declaring defeat over death and sin. Now, This is huge because what that means, the bottom line of the gospel is that means that Jesus's life gets placed on our life. We get his righteousness. We don't have to earn our righteousness. We get his righteousness and he took our sin. He paid the punishment for our sin. It's kind of like a trade that Jesus went to the cross, died in our place. He gave us what we could not do for ourselves. And so we receive that gospel. We hear that gospel proclaimed. Um, that is what creates believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's the message. That's the idea. Paul would talk about if, if we preach this message, this is how they're saved. If they hear, they'll be able to be saved. But we got to talk about it. We got to say something about it. And so when we accept the gospel message, here's what happens supernaturally. We don't understand exactly how it works. Um, but we receive God's spirit then when we accept the gospel. When when do we receive the Holy Spirit? When we accept and believe in the gospel. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, when we begin to, when our hearts begin to humble itself before the Lord and, and our will submits to God, we begin walking in that and the spirit begins to take up shop, build a house inside of our hearts. So Galatians 3.2 would say that. I only want to learn this from you. Paul's kind of angry with these guys at the Galatians. They've been, they've been mixing up the gospel. They've been, they've been teaching a, he actually calls it no gospel at all. It's no good news. Um, and, and what he says is, he's like, I only want to learn this from you. He said, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by believing in what you heard? He says there's two options. Did you receive it by by working yourself up to righteousness? Because that's what a lot of us believe, is that in order to get God's spirit, in order to get the seal, uh, if um, yeah, I think it's Ephesians, would call the spirit uh, uh, a seal for eternal life. 
He said, did you receive that spirit by works of the law? Did you earn it? Did you become righteous enough that it would set up shop in your home or in your heart? Or, or did you receive it by believing what you heard? Did you receive it by believing the gospel? What do you think the right answer is, A or B? B, absolutely it is. That is the truth. So Paul says, we've received that. So it's not that you've become pure enough that God can live in you. Let's get that straight. Let's get that on the table. Let's get that out of the way right now. Because a lot of us have this bent toward feeling guilty, like we're not being good enough for God, that when we do something wrong, there's going to be like lightning that happens, right? So like if you've if you accidentally said a word this morning when you were coming into church or as you were in this building, you probably looked up a little bit like, uh-oh, right? It's one of those things. It's not that you become good enough, pure enough, so that the Holy Spirit can come into your life. It's that your head and your heart has been humbled in the understanding that you have been living in rebellion against God. And to restore that relationship with him, you need Jesus' righteousness and sacrifice. So, when our will submits, the Holy Spirit then inhabits us. It's not about purity. When the will submits, then the Holy Spirit can do its work. Now, what is often misunderstood is the purpose and the ministry of the Spirit. I know that for some of you, you've been in church a long time, and, 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 and some, of these, some of these things that I'm saying, you're like, yeah, yeah, I get that. I understand that. That's, that's how I got to be a Christian. Great. Pay attention. Like, no, really, listen up. Because we hear the gospel so often, especially if you've been in the church 30, 40, 50 years, that you're like, yeah, 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 I know the story. Let's get on to something that I don't know. And we're, we're moved by new information. We're moved by some of these things. But, but here's what I want you to see. The gospel isn't just an entry right into Christianity. It isn't like going to the Secretary of State when you were 16, taking a test, doing the road test, and be like, yes, I got my driver's license. And then all you got to do is go take your picture every few years, Right? And you've got your license. You can drive, you know, and it's just like clockwork. It's not just an entry, right, that you say a few things and you get dunked and whatever your line of belief is as far as some of those things. Um, and then all of a sudden you're a Christian and then you don't have to look at that anymore. The gospel is not just the doorway to Christianity. It's the source of our entire Christian experience. In order to know the Spirit of God more, the gospel is the place we must continue to look, that we must continue to turn our eyes to. And it's arguably the most important and powerful means by which we experience the Spirit's presence. So the more we grow in understanding that in Jesus, God fully accepts us, that God sees you, as his blameless child, free of sin, perfect by the blood of Christ. The more we stare into that truth, the more you're going to grow in that truth. The more intimate, the more interaction you will begin to have with the Spirit of God. The deeper our knowledge of the gospel, the deeper our relationship with the Spirit. Let me say that again. The deeper our knowledge of the gospel, the deeper our relationship with the Spirit. And this is the cool thing. The deeper our relationship with the Spirit, by His floodlight, the deeper our knowledge of the gospel will go. It's cyclical. And it's growth. You know how you feel like you get caught in like, like, like bad habits and, and, and one thing leads to the next? So like, um, let's do food. Everybody eats food. Um, I think. Everybody eats food in here, right? Okay, just making sure. Um, <clears throat> that was a dumb joke. Sorry, cheap laugh. Uh, so what happens if you're trying to eat healthy, right? And you are like, oh, I'll just have a little sliver of cake today, right? What happens after that? You eat more cake. Yeah. 
because I already messed up today, right? Oh, there's a Snickers in the fridge, right? I mean, who keeps their Snickers in a fridge? Well, if you're trying to be good, it's out of sight, out of mind, right? You know, you keep it out of there. So, you know, and then all of a sudden it's just like this. And then if you're, if you're, you know, into this diet and you're just sick of it because you can't eat anything you like, you know, um, then, then all of a sudden you're off the diet, you're back to eating poorly again, and you're not making any progress. You get caught in this circular uh, trap, right? You know what I'm talking about? Did not explain that very well. Well, the same thing happens with this. Same thing happens here. Is that the more that we understand the gospel, so the gospel introduces us to the spirit, and then the spirit begins to introduce us more and deeper to the gospel. And then as we get more and deeper knowledge of the gospel, then we begin to experience more of the spirit. But sometimes what we do is we don't actually pay attention to the spirit. Um, but I want to show you this, this, this pattern. I want to show you this pattern in the, in the scriptures. Uh, we see it during Jesus' baptism in, in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. It says, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So this is a cool image. One that we can't fully get our heads around because Jesus is being baptized, um, which, which causes some confusion for us. But, but uh, what we're looking at here is a moment when heaven opens up. I mean, heaven literally opens up. Can you imagine the sky just going, and you're looking up and we can't see the face of God because it would kill us. Um, and like we're peering into the actual spiritual heavens. Oh, you're looking at me like, what? Yeah. I mean, that's how awesome it is. Listen, let your mind go there. Don't just look at me like I'm nuts. Let your mind go there. Let your mind be awestricken in wonderment of all of this. You can't even imagine what this looks like. Like you can't, you can't even begin to fathom. It's, it's, it's like when you see the sun off in the distance and the clouds are beginning to break up and it's just that right time of day that you see the sunrise, sun rays coming through the clouds and you can identify each ray of light like it's just this little flashlight. Like it's that times 100 million. You know what I mean? The skies just open up, just automatically. No weather pattern, no nothing going on. The skies open up. A spirit in the form of a dove, comes down from heaven, descends onto Jesus, and then a voice from heaven that was heard by the average folk says, this is my son with you, I am well pleased. Okay, put yourself in those shoes. Wouldn't you love for that to happen? Wouldn't that be awesome? Like if every baptism we did, the, the skies parted and a dove came down and settled on the person. I mean, we would just be all crying and weeping in the same room. I mean, we'd just be like, this is amazing. <laughs> We've got to allow ourselves to be in wonder of this. So here's the pattern. In Jesus' moment of submission, he was God in the flesh. In his moment of submission to God the Father, the Spirit descends on Jesus in what appeared to be this dove. And what was happening, as that was happening, God says, you are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. So we've got two elements to this. Spirit descending on a person and God speaking in that moment, speaking truth, speaking identity, speaking pleasure. So while we may not see a dove descend on us, the pattern is similar for us. Because Jesus took our punishment, we share Jesus' position before God. Let me show you this real quick. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, he says, For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus, or daughters of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. So we say that when we come to faith in Jesus, when we understand the gospel and accept it, we, we let our hearts submit. The Spirit comes into us. What we're saying is that we reside in Christ. Colossians 3 would say that we are hidden away with Christ. And so God looks at us in Christ and says, you, you are my beloved child. In you, because of Christ, 
I am well pleased. You didn't hear me or something, because <laughs> this is big stuff, and I'm trying to preach my guts out up here. All right, let's go. Well, that was anemic. I mean, come on. I had to ask for it, and then afterwards, like, amen. Yeah. Listen, I want to, 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 I want to stop saying I want to, but um, I, I need you to understand this. So shake the attention deficit out of your head, all right? Focus up and listen. In Christ Jesus. God looks at you. God looks at you. Becky, Wyatt, Barb, Carol, Brad, Sharon. Too many names. I look at people and I'm going to get them all confused. No, I know Jen, but yeah, I was just like, I was going to say, never mind, we're not going there. Um, not going to go there. In you, he looks at you. In Christ Jesus, he says, you are my beloved child. You are... You are my beloved child. Amen. You are my beloved child. And in, in Christ, Amen. in Christ, because of Christ, I am well pleased with you. This flies in the face of everything that that inner voice tells you throughout the week. This is, this is the weight of this whole thing. This flies in the face of you saying, I'm a failure, I'm a mess up, I don't belong. This flies in the face of you thinking that you could never get into heaven, that God doesn't accept you. This flies in the face of all of those things. It declares those things lies because God loves you. Because in Christ, you are his beloved child. I did ask for it. So I want you to let this sink into your heart. I, I, we're having fun with this. I get that. But, but I, I do want this to, to be genuine. Because this is a starting point for your faith. And I've heard all too often, God is testing me and I don't understand and I don't know where to go and, 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 and I don't know what, what to do next. My circumstances stink. I don't have enough money. I, my relationship's in turmoil. I'm struggling with understanding your truth. I'm under, I, can't, I can't even read the Bible because I don't understand it. And we get frustrated with all of these things. And I'm telling you that in this statement, in this what I'm trying to teach and what I'll be teaching over the next few weeks, in this you will experience God today. And it will not only transform your life, it will not only trans transform the way that you think, but it will transform the way you see the world. It will transform the way you interact with people. It will transform the effectiveness of your life. You will see God show up in ways that you've never seen Him show up before. Because as you believe your identity in the Lord, as you believe that you are God's beloved son, it doesn't mean you don't need work. Your kids do stupid things all the time, but you still love them, right? You want them to straighten up, right? You want them to, 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 to shape up or ship out, I guess, is one of the things that came to mind. But um, you want them to, to grow up to be great contributing members of society, Right? You want them to grow up to be in submission to the Lord. So that doesn't mean that when they're five years old and they steal quarters from a church, they, you, you put them on the executioning block, right? That doesn't, that doesn't mean those things. What are you? You're patient with them. You lovingly instruct them, sometimes lovingly discipline them. <coughs> Guys, God is the same way with us. You are his beloved child and he is going to lovingly instruct you. He's going to lovingly discipline you. But he so, so, so cares about you. He so cares about you. 
He says, you are my beloved child, and it, in you, because of Christ, I am well pleased. And I know we've said that a lot, and we've spent a lot of time on that. But it's important because as you believe that statement, as you meditate on that truth, as you understand God's love for you, the Spirit begins to fall on you just as it fell on Jesus. And as he floods our heart, we feel the truth of the gospel. We don't just know it, we feel it. And so the more intimate we become with the gospel, the more the Spirit manifests himself to us. The more I embrace that I am God's child, the more I am filled with his spirit. It just is this back and forth motion and, and, and cyclical pattern that we can go through. You see, we don't necessarily gain any new knowledge, but it's often the old knowledge that's becoming more real to us. If you, if you find yourself checking out during like sermons like this, when we're, we're talking about common things, this, I'm talking to, to, to the... To the veteran Christians here. If you find yourself checking out, that's a clue that you, you are not being moved by these things anymore. And the gospel is the most important thing that we have. It's the most important truth that we have. It is, it is the truth of our faith. So we don't gain any more new knowledge, but it's often this old knowledge becoming more real and, and awakening more things, transforming the way that we see, the way that we feel, the way that we think, the way that we respond to God. It awakens this mysterious relationship that we have with God the Spirit residing in us. And, and what we call this is the fullness of the Spirit. And it makes us feel the far-reaching love of God. So all of a sudden, this thing that we believe in goes from being a doctrine we believe to, to, to a honestly loving and living embrace from God our Father. If we initially received the Holy Spirit by believing in the gospel, then think about this. How would we, how would we get more of the Spirit in our lives? By receiving more of the gospel. If the gospel is how we get the Spirit, then wouldn't we return to the gospel to experience more of his fullness? Yeah, absolutely we would. So to grow, we don't just plead for more of his Spirit. Sometimes we get in that moment like, God, I just need to feel you. I just need your Spirit. I just need, ah, uh, ah, uh, you know, kind of. And, 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 and we definitely, there are, there are scriptures that, that, that advocate that, that we would ask for God's direction. We would ask for his Spirit. But, I think far more importantly, we would put renewed uh, faith in the gospel that we would know that because of Jesus, I am redeemed, I am pure, I am spotless, I am blameless in your sight. So we call our minds over and over again to the fact of, that who we are, children of God, by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, attempting to comprehend the length, the width, the height, the depth of God's love, that Christ's love for us is beyond anything we can measure or understand. And so in that truth, in renewing our minds, we begin to realize that we are justified by God, that God really does love us, that God doesn't just put up with us, <laughs> that God can use us despite our failings, that God can make strong our weaknesses that God really wants to make you the very best version of yourself that you can possibly be. You see, that's the root of this whole thing. And the more we understand this, the more full of the Spirit we become, the more power of the Spirit is released into our lives. And, and so what does the Spirit produce? How do we know if the Spirit is active and alive in us? Right? You don't have to hear God in order to know that the Spirit is active and alive in you. Does that make sense? You're like, yeah, because I think, I think you're nuts because you said you heard from God. I get that. How do we know? Well, we'll go back to Galatians real quick. Galatians. Um, oh, wait, no, 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 yep. We're going to go to Ezekiel first. 
I want to start with this promise because God promised a spirit thousands of years ago. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture. Ezekiel is talking in, in some prophecy here. And he says, I will give you a new heart. God will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Check that, a spirit I will put within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my what? Spirit. My spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Please pay attention to this. God says, my spirit will guide you. My spirit will convict you. It will cause you to follow my statutes. It will cause you to follow my ordinances, my commandments. Or in other words, my spirit will be the thing that enables you to live righteously before me. We're not living in bootstraps Christianity times. Sometimes we think, you know, we've got we to do this thing all by ourselves. So I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm going to summon up my willpower. And this week, I'm going to be perfect. How'd that work out for you? Three hours later, you stubbed your toe and you're like, ah! right? And it was all over. We fall unbelievably short of God's standard, but he says that there's going to be a day, which is today, that he's going to place a spirit within us and he's going to cause us. The spirit is going to cause us to walk in those ways. It's not on your power, it's on his. And so... Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, this is what the Spirit is going to produce. It is going to produce love. It is going to produce joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And, and Paul goes on to say that against these things, there is no law. You can have unlimited amounts on this. Now, so here's the thing. This is interesting because what are we talking about? Fruit of the Spirit, right? Fruit of the Spirit. Against these things, there is no law. So that means we can have unlimited amounts of fruit. Does that ring any bells based upon what we've been preaching on for the last months? Sounds like the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Oh, this is interesting. I'm not going to go there, but I just wanted to make you a little bit hungrier. It's a little appetizer. You can go look at that yourself. Sure, listen, you can practice more patience. How many of you wish you had more patience? What happens when you pray for more patience? You get tested. You get tested. Isn't that interesting? Something comes into your life and you're like, you're really testing my patience right now, right? Why? Do you think God wants you to learn a new skill or do you think God wants you to learn to rely on his Holy Spirit? What do you think? In that moment, when you are frustrated, when you are angry, when you are battling, when you are mad, God's calling you to lay down your instinct. He's calling you to lay down those things that are causing you to be all riled up and get your eyes tunnel visioned off of Him. And He's saying, listen to me. Let my spirit trust me, return to me, and I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to bring you peace. I'm going to bring you patience. In me, you can find unlimited amounts of this. But too often, we try to like do weird practices, you know. Now, I'm not saying like when you get mad at somebody and they're testing your patience, counting down from 10 isn't necessarily a bad idea. But working with God in the Spirit is what's going to bring an increased measure of these things. Same applies for all of these. So the vine by which these fruit grow come from the Spirit of God who fills us upon receiving the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel. I'll show you something else. 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, one of love, one of sound judgment. Right? This is cool. The Spirit in us, when, God, when we accept the gospel, when we begin to lean on God's Spirit, what begins to happen is He dispels fear. He doesn't 
reside with fear. Fear is really the opposite of faith. Fear is believing that something bad is going to happen. It's really going to, it's believing that darkness is going to happen and seeing that come to fruition. Faith, on the other hand, is believing in the hope that we have and seeing that come to fruition. And so you look at the difference. The spirit that we have been given is a spirit of faith. It is not a spirit of fear. And what the Spirit does for us, it brings to us one of power, one of strength, one of supernatural ability at times. But ultimately, just strength to get through the day. It combines that strength with love. Because we all know that unbridled strength without compassion leads to very bad things. And it leads to sound judgment. It leads to a holy judgment. These are the things that the Spirit produces, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture comes from Ephesians, where, where Paul is offering a prayer for the Ephesian church, and he's praying the very same thing that, that I'm going to continue praying for you, and it would be great if you would join me in this over the next few weeks. Ephesians three sixteen through 19 says, I pray, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power in your inner being through the Spirit, through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, in whose love? God's love, and understanding the gospel, and being firmly and, uh, 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 what do you say? Firmly established, rooted in this love. He says in verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love and to know that Christ's love, to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you would be filled with all the fullness of God. You know what that's code for? The fullness of the Spirit. That you would be filled with His Spirit. You see this connection play out again here in the pattern that we saw with Jesus' baptism. So, he then ends with this, after talking about that you would be filled with the fullness of God. This is how he ends his prayer, and I think it's very interesting. He says, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What's the power that works in us? God's spirit to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Uh, the NIV translate this. I memorized this verse uh, from the NIV version and it says, the, the, um, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. But have you ever seen God do immeasurably more than all you could ever ask or imagine? <laughs> Maybe in, in certain circumstances, but don't you wish God would do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine a little more often? I mean, we're not in control of God. He's going to do what, what God pleases. I'm not saying that just because we pray or because we become more intimate with the Spirit, but what the Bible would teach us and what we're going to discover over the next few weeks is that as we fall in love with the gospel, as we become more knowledgeable and more, more deeply rooted in God's love, our desires will begin to shift and will begin to change and we will desire what God desires. And, and so in partnership with God, as we follow Him through His Spirit, we're going to see the work of God just become... It's going to be commonplace. It's going to be just a regular thing that we see happen if we walk in... God's Spirit. Walk with God's Spirit. We cannot afford to miss this. We cannot afford to miss this. Especially if you've been feeling spiritually anemic lately. And I would argue that across the nation, our churches are feeling spiritually anemic because we have either misunderstood or we have just ignored God's Spirit. John 16, 7 says this, and, and this is where we're going to end. It says, nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. 
Listen to this carefully. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. Jesus said, it's for your benefit that I go away. Why? Because if I don't, the Spirit is not going to come to you. But if I do go, he says, then I will send him to you. Do you realize what, Je- what Jesus is saying in this moment? I don't, I, what I'm about to say is a quote from, from J.D. Greer, this guy that I read the book from. It almost seems controversial, but according to this text, it's true. Jesus himself said the spirit inside of us is better than Jesus beside us. The spirit inside us is better than Jesus beside us. That's powerful. The spirit inside of you is better. We should seek to know the spirit inside of you and not wish that Jesus would come back and walk alongside of us. Because if he, if he had not gone, we wouldn't have God at work within us today. As we seek to grow deeper in the gospel, we'll experience this specific direction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The result is a gospel-centered outlook on our lives, on the world, and he'll put a specific passion and, and gift for ministry in our hearts. So this week, I would, I would love to challenge you to read that prayer every day out of Ephesians chapter three, verses about 14 through 21. <laughs> Study it, break it apart, resonate with it. Because we need to understand how, how wide and how deep, how far reaching the love of God goes. It would be awesome. You can supplement that with other readings about the gospel and what Jesus went through. But this, is, this encounter with the gospel is what's going to kick off our understanding of who the Spirit is and what He does. And I, wanna, I want for you to understand that, that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how the Spirit interacts with Scripture. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about all of that. But I would love for you to walk out of here hungry today, ready to walk in this. Because remember, You who are in Christ, remember how much he loves you. The lengths that he went to rescue you from the chains of sin and deliver you into righteousness. Don't just let your mind think about it, but let it sink from your head to your heart and be moved by it. And start your quest to live your life following the direction of God the Spirit.